Well, good morning again. I trust that you've all had a good week, hopefully, or if it's been a challenging week, I trust that God has been with you in the middle of the challenges as well, as he often walks with us along the way. Um, Today we are continuing in Exodus. Um, I'm not sure how many more sermons I'm going to be eking out of this one, but boy, the Word of God is so rich, and you can spend so much time just exploring even one passage, just sometimes even a few sentences, even a few words. And I found out a little bit today as I was preparing. So we're going to be looking at Exodus 34, and we're only going to be looking at verses 1 through 9 today. So I'm sure there's probably some sighs of relief from you folks, at least somewhere out there, that Randy is not trying to get through the entire chapter in one sermon or we'd be here till 2 p.m. and uh, then I'd have some rather unhappy natives (laughs) if that were occurring. If you would be so kind, pull out your bulletins um, that are in your, uh, the the insert in the bulletins uh, with the outline for the the sermon. We want to just look at that very top part. I usually try to capture either a little bit of where the sermon is going or one of the major thoughts behind what God has put on my heart as I've been coming to the scripture. And so today we are looking at the glory of God. Moses had said in chapter 33, Lord, show me your glory. And that's actually going to happen as we look at it today. So Moses asked God to show him his glory. And what exactly did he mean? How do we define glory? John Piper once suggested that defining glory is like trying to define beauty. Words are inadequate to describe the concept. If we experience it enough, if we experience enough of it, then we begin to understand it. And glory is like that. To paraphrase Mr. Piper's definition, Here is a definition of the glory of God. It's the outward expression of God's character, his worth, his attributes, and his endless perfections. And I know that's a mouthful, and that can take time at this time in the morning on on a Sunday to wrap your brain around that, but I want you to think about that. The glory is the outward expression of God's character, his worth, his attributes, and his endless, infinite perfections. So let me ask you, how do you define glory? Would you know it when you see it? Or would you simply be overwhelmed by it? Let's look at the scripture this morning, Exodus 34, 1 through 17. And I'm reading from the New King James today. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he, Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, upon the children and the children's children to the third 
and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And as I look at that, and as you are probably becoming to get uh, accustomed to, I always try to f sum up what is, what is the essence of that text in a sentence, in one thought. How do we say it? And I think here, really, it's just God is known by our encountering him. It's not an academic exercise. It's not just something reading. It's not just seeing an image. God is known by encountering him. And that's what we want to do today. So as we look at this, you know, Lord, show me your glory, it raises the question, what does God look like? Well, this is a true story. About several years ago, a lady in Arkansas turned on the kitchen light in her mobile home. The reflection of the light on the mobile home wall looked to her like a man's face. She turned the light off, she turned it on. She turned it off, she turned it on. Every time she turned it back on, that image was right there. She was more and more convinced it was the image of a face. And she was certain it was a miracle. She could see the face of Jesus in that image on the wall. News soon spread and hundreds of people were visiting her trailer to walk into her kitchen and flip on the light. Because of the crowds, she started charging a dollar a person. A local television station interviewed one of the men who had paid his dollar to see the image. He was pretty skeptical. He said, I want my dollar back. It looked more like Willie Nelson to me. <laughs> well, the moral of the story here, if there is one, is that people are desperate to see Jesus. People are desperate to see God, and they will go to almost any length to encounter God, to see him, because of that hunger inside them. So a little background here, as I usually try to do for where we're going with the sermon. Uh, as I mentioned last week, it's been about four months now since uh, God led the people through Moses, led them out of Egypt, and out of slavery. They had been there in bondage for 430 years. And so while they're in the wilderness, while they're making this journey to Mount Sinai, where they are now, they've seen many miracles, many signs, many wonders. They saw them in Egypt. They've seen them along the way. They have received laws from God, including the Ten Commandments. Um, they've entered into a, a new blood covenant with their God, stating that they would be obedient to his laws. And with all of that, when Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days with God, and they didn't know how long he was going to be gone, and they didn't know what happened to him, they very, very quickly fell into idolatry, made a graven image, a golden calf, worshipped it in drunken, immoral revelry, and God was just about ready to wipe them out, except for the fact that Moses interceded with him right there, and said, Lord, these are your people. For your sake, not even their sake, for your sake, don't destroy them. And he was successful. God did not do that. But when Moses came down from the mountain, because he had just been told about what was going on, when he saw it with his own eyes, he was, probably, he was at least as outraged as God. And he cast down the stone tablets with the very words of God, written on them. God had formed those tablets. God had written on those tablets. It was the Ten Commandments. It was the absolute core of the covenant. And he comes down and he founds that people have broken the covenant with idolatry. And so he casts them down and they break. And it's a symbol that the covenant with God is broken. And so Moses destroys the idol confronts Aaron, who had made the idol, 
And then he commissioned members of the tribe of Levi. He called who's on the Lord's side. They came and he sent them throughout the camp to execute justice. And about 3,000 people were, were slain that day who were idolaters. And then the next day, Moses went back up the mountain to intercede more with, the peop- for, with God for the people. And God did forgive them, but he did bring plague upon them as well. Most seriously, though, he said to Moses at that time, I'm no longer going to be with you. My presence won't be with you. I'll send my angel to lead you. I'll even bring you into the promised land. I will do everything I promised, but my presence is not going with you. Moses understood how devastating that was. The people understood how devastating that was because without God there, if all they had was God's gifts and not God's presence, it was empty And it was useless because then they were bereft of their God and of their covenant. And so they did actually repent. The people repented. They repented deeply and they demonstrated a change of heart. And then Moses set set up a tent outside the camp, a good distance off, probably at least a half mile or more away from the camp. He set up a tent where he could meet with God. He would go out there. God's presence would come down in the form of a cloud. And that's where they would meet. And that was called the Tent of Meeting or the Tabernacle of Meeting. And it was during those meetings that Moses used his relationship with God, his friendship with God, to plead for the people and really to leverage for God to accept once again his people. And God did say, okay, I will do that. And I will bless them with my presence and I will go up with them. And that's when Moses said to God, after getting that assurance, please show me your glory. And God consented to meet his request. And so that's what brings us up to speed today. We're jumping in with the continuation of the story at the beginning of Exodus 34. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two stone tablets of stone. I'm sorry, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. And I should mention there too that You know, same one saying, let no man be there. That's just the generic for men and women. Let no person be there on the mountain. Only you, Moses, not even the animals. And so what we find here, we're starting at Exodus of 34, that it really requires us to engage our sacred imaginations here. We've got to imagine what's going on. We've got to see this create some mental picture of what's going on, even with Moses going up the mountain, what he's going to experience, because that may help us a little bit more learn how to experience God and feel the impact of what was going on. So God said, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. You know, those first tablets were God's handiwork. He had hewn them and fashioned them personally, and then he had written on them. But this time, This time he says to Moses, you hew out the stone tablets and bring them up. And then I'm going to write on them. And you know, no reason is given there of why he wants Moses to do it rather than him doing it a second time. But there's a key point here. The key point is that the tablets themselves are not important. What is important is the very words and laws of God that are inscribed on those tablets. And God said, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets. You know, with God expressing his intent to rewrite the law for them, for the tablets, 
that's good news for God's people because he's saying, I still want you to have my law. I still want you to understand me. I still want you to be in covenant with me. And so I will once again write my laws on these tablets for you. And so he's confirming his covenant with his people Israel one more time. But I want you to think about that for a moment. He said, I will write on these tablets, these stone tablets. And I was thinking about that as I was preparing this message. And and, and I was thinking about the word that God brought through the prophet Jeremiah about 800 years later. And this is what God says to, through Jeremiah in chapter 31, verse 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Just think about that, because that's actually quoted again, or that section is quoted in in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 8 as well. But consider this, God's even there saying, he started out with tablets of stone, now he's saying, I'm going to write my laws on the tablet of your heart, the tablet of your mind. It's going to become that personal, you're going to own it that much. It's going to define who you are. It's not just on stone, something rigid and cold. It is on your hearts. And then he makes that comment regarding the stone tablets, which you broke, the first ones. And I want you to notice, God did not condemn Moses here. He's simply stating a fact. Moses breaking those tablets was not a petulant action. It really was, again, demonstrating the covenant was broken by the people. And so if the covenant was going to be restored, the tablets had to be replaced. And so then God said, so be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. You know, he's saying to Moses, come up on the mountain now. Not, nothing more with a tent of meeting. That's important but I want you really far away from the people. Um, And so he's calling Moses one more time to the top of Mount Sinai, and he must make the effort to go to the very, very top of the mountain where God's going to meet him. And I was looking up Mount Sinai to just see how tall it is. It's about 7,497 feet above sea level. And that's just its elevation. So, you know, when I was younger, I did a lot of hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And, you know, you might have a mountain 6,000 or more feet tall, but the trail to get up to the top of that mountain was not just the the straight up elevation. It was easily four, five, six miles, just one way getting up there. So when he's saying, Moses, get up and come up in the morning, you know, Moses has a trek ahead of him. He's got some effort there. And, you know, just as a, as a comparison, the highest mountain in, in, uh, in the White Mountains in Massachusetts, in in New Hampshire, Mount Washington, that's 6,288 feet, which is a good 1,000 feet less than here uh, with Mount Sinai. And I can tell you, I hiked that mountain. That was a hard mountain to hike. So thinking of mountain, of Moses, carrying uh, uh, these stones, stone tablets, carrying them up. That's a challenge. That, That takes some effort. And then God said, and no man or person shall come up with you and let no person be seen throughout the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. You know, When he was up there last time, Joshua was two-thirds of the way up, probably. There were the 70 elders that were there as well, further down. This time, nobody, nothing, just Moses. And this was important because God intends to reveal his glory to Moses. And his glory will be overwhelming, and his glory can be deadly and devastating for those who are not prepared to experience it. And so 
The issue here is not even the people's sin that they've been forgiven of, but it's more the sheer power associated with God unveiling more of his true form to Moses. And it's not just the sheer power, it's the overwhelming holiness, his overwhelming righteousness, his justice, his purity, all those things. And it can devastate the people if they're not ready for him. So God actually wanted to protect them, and that's why he's saying, only you, Moses. But then we see the response. We see what Moses does. He cut the two tablets of stone like the first one, first ones, and then he rose up early in the morning and went up the mount, just like God had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now, I want you to just put a little thought into this for just a moment. Think about those tablets that he chiseled out. You know, he just had an evening to do it. God says, do this and get up in the morning. And so, because these are going to be bearing the law of God, I'm sure Moses did it himself. He didn't assign somebody to do it. And who knows what kind of stonemason he was, but I'm going to bet you these were not pretty wonderful sculptured kind of things like Michelangelo could do. These were probably pretty rough hewn kinds of tablets. And also even just thinking about the size, you know, it says that he carried them in his hand. They may not have been that big. Now, just in his hand could have been an idiom for, you know, both his hands or something like that, or maybe even his arms. But it doesn't say he carried them up in his arms. Or he even carried up in his hands. He carried up in his hand on that right there. So, you know, just as far as trying to imagine this, it really doesn't take a big, big tablet to write five laws on one side, five laws on the other side, because these were written on both sides. Minor point, but just you've also got to think he's trudging 7,500 feet vertical with these tablets. They're probably not that big, not that heavy. But then after he chiseled him out, you know, he probably also had to talk with Aaron and the elders before that evening before getting up to go see God, just to make sure that, okay, this time there's not going to be any problems when I come back down, right? You know, you can just imagine that conversation. So he had a busy evening, and yet regardless, he rose early. The scripture says he got up early in the morning and headed up the mountain, blank tablets in hand. And there's an application point right there, you know, when God tells you, to do something. When he tells me to do something, we should be obedient immediately. We shouldn't delay. We shouldn't say, well, I'll get around to it, God, or well, I've got A, B, C, D, and E before I can do what you told me to do. We should be obedient quickly. And so I want to ask you, is there anything that God's been speaking to you about to do that you've been dragging your feet on? Because if so, now's a really, really good time to repent of that and to just start obeying and change direction with that. And look at what's caused the delay. Was it fear? Was it laziness? Was it just your life is too comfortable that you didn't want to make whatever change or do whatever God told you to do? Is your life schedule so busy? You're like, oh, Lord, I would love to do that, but I can't get around to it. God comes first. And we need to keep the first things first. So ask God to help you to follow through on his directions and his commands to you. And he will. But now we get to the, the, the major part here of the scriptures we're looking at. And that is the revealing, where God reveals himself to Moses. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. <clears throat> and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So that first sentence, Now the Lord descended in the cloud. And stood with him. You know, I want you to think about that. Moses is already 7,500 feet above sea level. He's, he's going all the way up the mountain. God still has to come down to meet him. God still has to bow down, bend down, accommodate 
us. No matter how high we try to go up to meet God, we can never achieve that. It's like the distance between us and God that sin has caused. There is no way we can cross that insurmountable distance. It can only be covered. It can only be crossed with the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus and the very act of God in saving us. And so really for us to have an encounter with God at all kind of requires his infinite condescension of coming down to us. And then I want you to note that the cloud comes down, but the cloud itself is not the Lord. It says that the Lord was in the cloud. And so he descends within the cloud and then he stands with Moses there on the mountaintop. And we don't know exactly what that looks like, but at least his presence somehow is there with Moses beyond just the cloud itself. And you know, Moses has seen this cloud many, many times. It's come down when he's been at the mountaintop. It's come down when he's been out at the tent of meeting. It's led them out of Egypt and on their travels. But there was something more, something distinct with it this time because God is about to fulfill what he promised to Moses in the previous chapter that he would reveal himself and he had said in Exodus 33 19 through 23 I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now, that was chapter 33. We're in chapter 34. God doesn't mention a second time, oh, I'm going to throw you in the cleft and put my hand over you, anything like that. But you can bet that he did it. And so we just want to keep that in mind when it mentions about the Lord passing by Moses. God has still done what he said he needed to do to preserve Moses' life. And so now I want you to look at the order of things as they, as they play out through, through these verses here, 1 through 7. God comes down and stands with Moses. God proclaims his covenant name, Yahweh, to Moses. God passes by Moses as Moses is hidden in the rock cleft with God's hand covering him. And God proclaims some of his attributes to Moses as he passes by. And we need to pause here for a moment and remember what Moses petitioned to God was. Please, Show me your glory. Show me. You know, what's strange here, commentator had mentioned this, and I hadn't really thought about it. What's strange here is that the Bible says almost nothing about God's appearance. Moses wanted to see God. But rather than, te- rather than telling us what he saw, the Bible tells us what he heard what the Lord had proclaimed to him. And you know, this makes sense though, because if we look at Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the the well in John chapter chapter four, in verse 24, he says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is spirit. You know, there's really not a lot to see here, folks, with a spirit. Our, Our physical eyes just cannot remotely see God. Only our spirits can see him. Only our spirits can understand. And it really isn't until Jesus came, New Testament times, where God came in the flesh. That is what the word incarnation, carn, that's where we get the word carnivor, flesh, incarn, in flesh. That's when God finally had a physical body where he could be encountered and seen. But even within that, it is nothing compared to the spirit that it contains. And so when we want to see 
Jesus, when we want to encounter God. It really is something that we do with our spirits. And so that's something we engage our minds, our hearts, and that's why it was so important for God to declare who he was. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, somebody asked me, tell me about your wife. And uh, I think it was in the announcements or something. My wife and I, this coming Saturday, it's our 34th anniversary. I'm excited about that. You know, 34 years is a long time. And there, you know, Lord bless us. There's a lot of people in this congregation who are a lot, who are married a lot longer than 34 years. And, and I just praise God for the longevity of those things. But, you know, I think, how would I describe my wife? Well, okay, you know, I could say, well, she's this tall and she's got this color hair and she's slender and she's beautiful and blah, blah, blah. But really what I would be doing is I would be telling you about her qualities, about her love for people, about her heart for service, about her giftings that God's given her. I really wouldn't be talking about appearance. Now, if you asked my wife, tell me about your husband, I'm sure the first words of, out of her mouth would be something like, oh, he's a bronze Adonis. But uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe not, maybe not on that right there. I'm hoping she's gonna hit a couple other qualities or I'm in big trouble. Uh, but that's what it becomes with God. Tell us about your God is to talk about his qualities, who he is, his attributes. And so that's what God did here. And so with that, with him proclaiming his qualities, it's basically showing that God's presence is more than something to be seen. It's something to be experienced. You know, in this world, because everything's going to be passing away, everything physical is just going to be passing away as well. So anything you experience is just temporary. You know, the entire universe had a beginning, and God was there before that to create it. And it's going to have an end, and God will be there too, refashioning it, making all things new. He said, behold, I'm, I'm going to make a new earth, a new heavens. God more than spans time. He's outside of time. He is eternal. And you know, this is why forming and worshiping idols is so repulsive and evil to God. Nothing, nothing in the created order could possibly ever and throw a few more evers there, ever, ever, ever. Nothing could possibly ever capture or demonstrate the tiniest bit of the glory of the infinite God. And that's what an idol does. It tries to capture that, and it is so completely a mockery and so completely infinitesimally small and ugly and pitiful. And that's why God calls it such a great evil. And what's really, really sad is that our hearts can be drawn away from the one true God by those idols. That's why God hates idolatry so much. But let's, re let's at least consider what God does allow us to see regarding his glory. You know, God's glory is found in overwhelming light, even spectacular light. You know, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 said this, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts, and here's the key point, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And you know, that's what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew had described it this way, that this is what Peter and John uh, had seen. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And we see this again at the end of the book. In Revelation 21, verses 23 and 24, the city, the new Jerusalem, does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb, Jesus, is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light. 
So if there's one thing that can be seen with God, it's overwhelming light. And let's look now at how God described himself in revealing himself to Moses as well. The Lord passed before him, before Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, I'm going to also read that in the NIV translation, which captures really very similarly what many other translations say as well. Just update some of the language a little bit. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, one commentator made this comment, and I think he's onto something here a little bit. He had said that these are arguably among the most important verses in the Bible, at least in the Old Testament, especially verse 6, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And we know it's important because we see it popping up again and again, dozens of times, just in the Old Testament alone. King David prayed, but you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And that's Psalm 8615, Psalm 103, verse 8, Psalm 148, 145, 8. So it comes up again and again and again. The prophet Joel said, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And you know, Jonah said the same thing when he's complaining to God about God's mercy when God sends him to Nineveh. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Noticing a theme there, folks? This really, these first words that God spoke to Moses as he was revealing himself became the people's working definition of God. If anyone wanted to know who God was, they just went back to Moses and he said, the Lord, and, and they said, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Think about that, a working definition of God. But let's look a little more closely now at the self-revelation and what some of those words meant. First of all, God starts by saying, the Lord, the Lord. And even depending on which translation you have, it might say the Lord God or it might stick God, you know, in the next phrase there. Either way on that right there, what's really happening is it's Lord, capital letters. That's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. You know, all the other nations around there, they had their own gods and they had their own names. You had Baal, you had Asherah, you had uh, uh, Moloch, you had all these others. Only the nation of Israel had Yahweh as its God. Yahweh, which means I am who I am, the eternally exist, self-existent and all-sufficient one. And this is what God was proclaiming himself when he reiterated it, not just once, but twice there. This is who I am. It's for emphasis. I am who I am, and I am the eternal self-existent one. Now let's look at that next word, merciful. Other translations pretty frequently actually refer to it as compassionate. <clears throat> and it means sympathetic, tender, kind. You know, God's initial response when he looks upon our miserable state of sin is to respond with tenderness and sympathy, not with anger or disgust or judgment. He wants to help us, not harm us. And that concept is captured in Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows 
how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And then the next word, gracious. You know, almost all the English translations translate this one as gracious. And it's carrying this implication as well of mercy, which, you know, we'd already looked at merciful and compassionate, meaning the same thing there. Um, It basically means we don't get what we deserve. God gives us grace. That's where the word gracious would come from. He gives us grace, which is unmerited good favor. We can't earn favor. We can't even come close to earning it. And yet God gives it anyway, because it is part of his very nature, his very being. And then the next word, long-suffering, most commonly translated slow to anger in most of the translations that I looked at. Long-suffering is kind of this older English word. And what it means is patient. God's not reactionary. He doesn't fly off the handle, so to speak, when provoked by our sin or our rebellion or our stubbornness. And his reactions when he is provoked, they're measured, they're deliberate, and they're righteous. He's patient. He's slow to anger. And he remembers again that we're only dust. So he isn't sitting up there in heaven on some cloud with a lightning bolt in his hand going, okay, who do I get to smite today? He's looking down and he's saying, who can I extend grace to today? Who needs more love? Almost because they're screwing up even more. That's a quality of God that he proclaimed. And abounding in goodness and truth. Merriam-Webster's online uh, dictionary gives this definition for abounding. Existing in or providing a great or plentiful quantity or supply. In other words, God has a full and ready supply of goodness and truth. And this word goodness is the Hebrew word hesed. And it's an amazing word that is translated a bunch of different ways, but they all capture kind of the same idea. Loyal love, faithful love, loving kindness, steadfast love, unfailing love. It's love, but it's more than just love. It is love without measure. And it's God's unreserved covenant love for his people. He holds back nothing in loving us. And that's goodness, hesed. And then you also have truth, which is also translated by many of the the translations as faithfulness. And it's implying stability and reliability. So God's truth and faithfulness can be counted on and anticipated. So his love and his faithfulness, his, his overwhelming love is always stable. It's always reliable. We can count on it. And as one other commentator had mentioned here regarding that abounding in goodness and truth, is that it's not merely adequate, but abounding is this great God of glory. He has barns and silos full of love and faithfulness. He's stacking it up in the streets looking for a distribution system just to get it out to us, just to give it to us. That's the abounding love of our Lord. And then keeping mercy for thousands. The Hebrew word translated mercy is once again that Hebrew word hesed. The one that was just used in the last one that was translated as as goodness. And again, that concept is is God's steadfast, loyal, endless covenant love and his loving kindness. So he keeps that not just for us, but for thousands, for, for an endless, overwhelming number of people as well. And as Psalm 136 says over again and again and again, his love, his loving kindness, his mercy endures forever. And then forgiving iniquity, or wickedness and transgression, also known as rebellion and sin. Forgiving, the Hebrew word there is nasa, 
And one of the most common ways of translating it is to carry or to lift off or even to bear, like bearing a burden. And what's really important about that word as well is that when it talks about God being forgiving here, that word is used, that Hebrew word is used in Isaiah 53 verse 4 regarding Christ's redeeming work on the Christ, where it says, surely he took up our pain and bore, nasa, our suffering. That's what the forgiving is. He bore our suffering. And he bore it on the cross so that divine justice could be fulfilled against all sin. So iniquity and wickedness, transgression and rebellion and sin. You know, that pretty much covers it all. And there are three categories here of unrighteousness. Wickedness, sometimes, uh, it basically means to turn aside from what is right and good. Rebellion is more defiant. It's a willful violation of the terms of the covenant, not merely disobeying a rule or regulation, but betraying the relationship one has with the covenant king. Anyone who commits this kind of sin is a traitor to God. And then finally, that last word, just sin. It's the most general, and you know, it refers to any kind of moral failure. And the point of giving all three of those terms is that God is willing to forgive any and every type of sin. And so this puts away that idea that the God of the Old Testament is a bad and evil and vindictive God, and that the God of the New Testament is a kind and merciful, loving God. He is the same yesterday and today and forever, and there is such consistency of character. So just an application point there. Are there any of your sins that are still weighing you down? that you feel so badly about, that you're feeling, God, you really can't forgive this one, can you? And it stops you from being effective for God. It stops you even from going into his presence. Recognize, as it says here, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, the entire gamut. If he can forgive those, then he can forgive you. And if you have a problem working through that, then come to me, come to one of the elders, and we will help you find and discover the forgiveness of God. And then just very briefly, where it says about by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. You know, that can be a really hard verse, and it almost sounds like it's negating everything that was just said about God's mercy and forgiveness. But it's not. Really what it's referring to is those who are unrepentant. Because if you're unrepentant, then God can't visit his forgiveness upon you. You're not going to experience it. And if you won't turn from your sin and seek God, that's going to have its effect on others as well. You know, that gift has to be received in order to be able to be used. And there could also be lasting consequences to your sin. You know, it could be an unplanned pregnancy or some kind of disease that you got from alcoholism or, or promiscuity or some other kind of thing. And God may not take those away. It may be the effects of that sin still being visited upon you or with some things like alcoholism, that kind of thing. That goes in families. That goes genetically as well. And sometimes breaking those chains. Have you ever caught yourself saying this? And so many people, especially who come from dysfunctional homes, they hear the parents fighting, they hear other kinds of stuff, they say, I would never say something like that to anybody. I would never act like that. You know what happens? They grow up and they start saying those things and they start acting like that. And they go, how did I become my parent when I swore that I never would? The sins of the parents being visited upon the children and sometimes that God, takes God time to work that through generations to really be able to work it out of a family in his grace. And then also, too, just remember additionally that 
In this culture, you had three or four generations all living in a house or living in a tent. And so when you had something being visited upon the other generations, there was no way around it. If there was sin in the camp, if there was sin in the tent, it was going to affect others as well. The last part, the reaction, we're going to get to that next week. I need to wrap up here. And I have plenty more planned for next week as well. But I want you to remember, this was a quote I had read last week, again from John Piper. And we want to consider it as we're looking at God's glory and that desire for God's glory. If you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because you have drunk deeply and are are satisfied. It's because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great. We want to experience the greatness of God. We want to experience the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we want to be like Moses. Show us your glory, Lord. We want our hearts and our minds to be opened up enough that we even dare such boldness in prayer. We want to come boldly to the throne of grace. That's where you are, Lord. So I pray for everybody here. Create that hunger in each one of us. Lord, move us away from nibbling endlessly at the small things of the world so that we're so full from those that we have no hunger for the big things of you. Lord, let us see you. Let us see your glory. Let us be changed by your glory. And Lord, let us then be a witness of your glory to a dark and dying world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.